So we have some new people, and why don't we go around and do names so that you know everyone? Start here. Can I finish? Daniel. Ash. Mumuj. Milan. Puni. Okay. So welcome to our first lesson of a text I've never taught before. Can you poke the white box there? Panchadashi of Vidyaranya. So a little bit of background. Vidyaranya is considered one of the principal writers in the Advaita Vedanta tradition post Adi Shankara. Adi Shankara we date usually from 788 to 820. Vidyaranya, there's some debate over when he was born. Some texts say 1285, others, I think the Sringiri Mutt people say 1296. And he was a, a major figure politically in the, I think it's pronounced the Vijayanagara Empire, is that right? Vijayanagara. Vijayanagara. And uh, so he was a uh, counselor to three Rajas, three kings, and then later became um, the Shankaracharya of the Sringiri Mat. Some of the texts say that he took sannyas early in life, around 1331, something like that. Others say he did not take sannyas until he was much older. So this empire is in the south of India. Sometimes it's also called the Karnataka Empire, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of where he is. So this is one of his most significant texts. Panchadashi simply means 15 chapters. And it is divided into three sections of five chapters each. And they correspond to the great uh, utterance, Sat Chit Ananda. 
So the first five chapters are about sat, pure existence. Second five are about chit. Third about anam, which is a really juicy section, one of the clearest that's been written on this subject. So um, there are some interesting things online. You can Wikipedia him if you wish, and you want to learn more about him. So let's dive directly in. Oh, this is what we call a Prakarana text. So it's a workbook. It's designed to study slowly. This is not a speed read. And each one of these verses has what we call exercises in contemplation. Their intention is to change the way in which we see ourselves and the world. Now, in the tradition, we have what's called paroksha jnanam and aparoksha jnanam. What's paroksha jnanam? Indirect knowledge. Indirect knowledge. This is when we intellectually understand it. We get this from the teacher. We get this from reading the scriptures and commentaries and maybe YouTube videos. But in order for it to move from paroksha jnanam to aparoksha jnanam, direct experience. We need abhyasa, practice. Abhyasa Vairagya Basically, that's all of yoga, those two sentences. So, a requisite for this class is daily or at least regular meditation. Minimum 20 minutes a day. If you can do a half an hour, 40 minutes, or an hour on a daily basis, good. But these verses, these exercises in contemplation will not bear fruit if we don't practice. Now, that doesn't mean not to come to class. The Parochiyanam can be useful, can inspire us. At a later date, these ideas will come back when we do have the inspiration to practice. Any thoughts on this before we get into the text? All right, well, who would like to chant for us and read tonight? Okay. Start with chapter one. Chapter one, verse one. Pratamo Dhyayaha Tattva Vivekaha. Chapter one, the differentiation of the real principle. And this is the, yes, the, the differentiation of what is. Tattva. Okay, going on. Namaha Sri Shankarananda Guru Padamba. Guru Padambu Janmane Savilasa Maha Moha Graha Grasau Pakarmane Salutation to the lotus feet of my Guru Sri Shankar Shankarananda, whose only work is to destroy the monster of primal nescience together with its effect, the phenomenal universe. So again. is the salutations to a person, a human being, Shankarananda, right? Mm -hmm. Or 
is it to the bliss of Lord Shiva? Shankara is just another name for Shiva. So as is usual in these verses, there's layers of meaning. So he starts with a salutation to the Guru. Swamiji always used to say, the physical Guru is a temporary psychological device. The real guru, in the end, is your own self-nature, Shankarana. When you find out who you are, you will find out who the guru is, or the reverse. When you find out who the Guru is. Find out who you are. Now, here Vidyaranya draws our attention to what I call the salvific principle. That which saves us. So we're going to be starting the fourth chapter of Gita this coming Sunday. This is the chapter in which Lord Krishna will say, in every age, even though I don't have to, when ignorance and evil and suffering is starting to increase, I incarnate for the salvation of humanity. You all remember that verse in Gita? Very famous one, very famous one. What does this principle mean? When you and I have done all that we want to do in the world. We've gone after what I call the cash and the prizes, ambition, material things, cars, houses, money, boats, whatever it is. What we eventually find out is, eh, okay, but that doesn't fulfill the human art. I want something permanent. I want something real. This is when actually we become fully human. Before that, we're just kind of an animal with two legs. We start asking those profound questions. This comes by grace. This comes by the salvific principle, our suffering, our longing in both And then Guru shows up in many different forms. Here, for Vidyaranya, it showed up as this person, Shankarana, Shankarana, Shankarananda. And like this salvific principle, the Guru's only job is to free us from our suffering to free us from our ignorance. Why? What is the cause of my suffering? 
ego says it's people, places, things, and conditions that are making me unhappy. I don't have the right partner. I don't have the right job. Uh, a relative has died. The economy has crashed. It's all out there. But what yoga says is the root cause of my problem is avidya. Ignorance. What am I ignorant of? I do not know who I am. And I do not know what this world is. So that is the goal of the guru principle. Um, if you take a Sanskrit class, they will tell you that the word guru means heavy. But there's another etymology. Gu means things that are covered or hidden. We get words like uh, guhyam, secret, gufa in Hindi, k, all come from the same root. <clears throat> so the guru is that which uncovers that which is hidden. So here, Vidyaranya on the surface does the standard salutation to his guru. But he's really invoking this deep principle of guru, this salvific principle that removes our spiritual ignorance. Now, in 1994, I was in Kerala, and I went to the ashram of Amaji, the hugging guru. Maybe some of you have met her. Did you folks ever meet her? Yes, no? Yes. And I was there about 10 days. And it was, it was a nice place to hang out. And there would be people coming from all over the world, mostly from India, inside India. They would line up for hours and hours and hours to come get her darshan. But I would just watch. And people would come up and they go, Oh, Amaji, should my son marry this girl? Oh, Amaji, should I do business with so and so? In other words, here in front of them was a great Mahatma, and they treat her as a fortune teller. Now, because she's an incarnation of compassion, she'd answer their questions. But the real purpose of the guru, read again what Vidyaranya says, whose sole purpose is to destroy the monster of primal nations together with its effects within our universe. Yes. To destroy nations means ignorance, to destroy ignorance. Now, what does it mean to destroy the phenomenal world? I talked about what is our wrong view. The wrong view is I do not see who I am, and I do not see what the world is. Instead, I think I'm a person. I think I'm my body, or my body plus the personality, the subtle body. And I think the world is separate from me, and 
It's joy giving and misery producing. It's out there. And the right view is Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. Or as Shankara says, Chidananda Rupaham, Shihoham, Shihoham. This consciousness, Shiva. And what about this world? Well, we have two scriptural statements which seem to contradict. In Viveka Chudamani, in the uh, qualifications of a fit student being Adhikari, he'll say, Brahma Satyam Jagannit. Brahman alone is real. The phenomenal world is mitya. It's illusion. It's a lie. But then many of you have heard me quote one of my favorite mantras from Chandogya Upanishad. Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. All this is barely done. Well, make up your mind. Is it illusion or is it Brahman? Yes. The names and forms are illusory. What appears as name and form in reality is consciousness. So here, when Vidyaranya says that the destruction of our ignorance destroys the phenomenal universe, doesn't mean we no longer see a world of name and form. It means I see it as it really is. God is solid, separate, Joy giving, misery producing. I love her. She's where the joy is. I hate him. Oh, gone. gone. Yeah. <clears throat> Any questions or thoughts on this very first <coughs> verse? Can I get all the pieces? I think so. All right. <coughs> Number two. Tatpadam buruham dvadva seva nirmada chetasam sukha bhodhaya tatvasya vivekoyam vidhiyate. This discussion about the discrimination of truth, Brahman from untruth is being initiated for the easy understanding of those whose hearts have been purified by service to the pair of, pair of lotus feet of the teacher. Yes. So here in the second verse, Vidyaranya says, for whom is this text suitable? And he says, it's suitable for those whose hearts have become purified to some degree. Now, in Yoga Vasishta, we get a bit of expansion on this. It says you start off with taking half the mind and you put it into worldly enjoyment. You take a quarter of the mind and you do some service, another quarter of the mind in serving the Guru. And after some time, you take just a quarter of the mind and let it indulge in the world. 
and you take a quarter of your mind and you do some scripture study and then do some seva and then satsang with the guru. And after your mind gets a little bit pure, they do some scripture study, learning how to deeply surrender to the teacher. I was in Jaipur in 2015. And I was hanging out at the ashram of this wonderful saint. His name is Bhuvaneshwara Ananda. And he's part of the Kriya Yoga tradition. And I was traveling with my friend Dave Dutt. And Dave Dutt had asked him, what was his sadhana? And he said, I just sat at the feet of my teacher, Pati Baba, for seven years. Tuning up the mind. So this, in the end, this tuning up of the mind. Deep introversion. Purifies the mind. Now, we do need to do some of the external work. If we're beginners, a good place to start are the yamas, niyamas of Raja Yoga. Things like uh, satyam, have some integrity, tell the truth. Uh, ahimsa, non violence. Salt your ear, not only cleanliness, but you know, watch your speech and stuff like that. Too. They're ten of them. But later on, later on, Viveka, Vairagya It's constant discrimination between the real and the unreal. Letting go of our attachments. Letting go of our identification with any personal sense of self. Tuning up. Any thoughts on this? All right, number three. Shaktas Parshada Yo Vedhya Vechitra Jagare Prithak Tato Vibhakta Tat Sanved Ekaru Panya Bhidhyate. The objects of knowledge, is sound, touch, etc., which are perceived in the waking state, are different from each other because of their peculiar peculiarities. But the consciousness of these, which is different from them, does not differ because of its homogene uh, homogeneity. Homogeneity, I think, is in to do yeah. in, in, in American English. So here he's beginning to introduce us to the primary meditation we get, in, especially in the beginning of our Vedanta study. Goes by many names. Atman an Atman Vivechanam, the discrimination between the self and the not self. Drishya Viveka, discrimination between the seer and the seen. What he's basically saying is this that which can be known differs. The lamp is not the water glass, which is not the chair, which is not the coffee table, 
which is not Daniel. These objects all are different. It's, the, it's different from the sound of the traffic, etc. But I know them all. Which brings me to a very important point. Some people study the Vedanta and they make an important error. And in doing so, they never get real freedom. And the error is this. What do you think about the self? The self being an idea to them. Well, what do you think about the self? Well, the scripture says the self is like this. In other words, I unconsciously think of the self, Paramatman, as something other than me. We must start with our direct experience. Who sees the phone? I do. That's yourself. You're not going to get another self. Yeah, but I'm just a little wormy person with no power and I'm unhappy all the time. Don't worry about that. We are going to start with your direct experience. Who is the knower? of all phenomena. And here Vidyaranya says, all of the phenomena differ. But the noumenon, the knower of all the phenomena, is one. So what are we in invited to do? This radical reversal of the attentive faculty. Or as Ravana Maharshi used to say, Koam, who am I? So when I see the table, to whom did this occur? To me. Koham. Who am I? And don't try to answer it. Oh, I am the self. I am Jim. But stop. The mind made very quiet. See if you can notice. What is my essential nature? But you will see. Shidana the Rupaha. I am of the form of bliss consciousness. Well, you may not feel very blissful, but at least can you see that it's vast and empty? The Rupa Sishta uses the term Chidankasha. Space of pure awareness. You have to see, does it ever change? Well, I woke up today and I'm a little gray ball with wings. No. Always the same. Don't believe me. Don't believe Vidyaranya. Look. And if you can't discern that, no problem. We go back to the prior shloka. More purification of the heart. It's all that need happen. Empty out. Empty out. Viveka. This is our principal basic meditation. 
So if it has a beginning and an end, if it occurs in time and space, if it's something perceived through the five outer senses, and later on in the next verse, we'll talk about feelings and thoughts. If it's subject to change, if it has qualities, most importantly, is it knowable? Is it an object of cognition? Not self. Very basic. Any thoughts on this practice? So Nilong, have you worked on this with your folks yet? Yes. Any questions about this in Zoom land? Hi, this is Sheila. <laughs> Adiós, Sheila Ji. Sorry, I have a question. Um, so aren't we using our intellect to know the knower? Meaning like our uh, we have to do a radical reversal of our attentive faculties. And one of the attentive faculties is the intellect. So the intellect is the one observing the knower. So, so we kind of know that the soul is there, the, the vast consciousness. So then that means it's not it. Uh, All right. Know. Excellent question. Okay. So there are two kinds <clears throat> of knowledge that are going to be taking place here. The first knowledge is the real knowledge. And that is the self-evidence of the self. How do you know you were you? You do not see, hear, taste, touch, or smell yourself. You do not emote yourself. You do not think yourself. Yet you do not doubt that you are. You may doubt what you are, but you do not doubt that you are. Is not that your direct experience? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, you shine as consciousness. I know phenomenal objects. I know feelings. I know thoughts. So I not only exist, suck but I shine as awareness, Chip. Yes. What is self-realization? Both bondage and liberation occur to the mind. The self is ever free. So what were what is my bondage? My bondage is nothing else but the deeply rooted conviction in my mind that I'm bound, meaning I think I'm my body. There is no other liberation than this transformation of the subtle intellect when the buddhi becomes buddha. And what does it realize? It doesn't realize, oh, I'm a great person now. I'm a Mahatma. Touch my feet. No. That subtle intellect realizes, oh, I was never a person. It was just a figment of my imagination. Now, I usually give an exercise in the, my basic course to try to give people an idea. So are you wearing trousers today, Sheila? Um, no, I'm not. You wearing a skirt? No. You're not wearing anything? No, I'm <laughs> wearing yoga pants. Okay, you're wearing yoga pants. Have you been wearing them all day? No. When did you put them on? <laughs> like 520. 520, okay. 
Bring your mind to the sensation of the waistband in your yoga pants. Are they loose? Are they tight? They're pretty tight. They're pretty tight. Okay. That feeling has been there since 520. Yes. <laughs> you just didn't pay attention to it. I did. I want to remove my pants, but <laughs> <laughs> that I just. But my my yeah. point is this. There's two experiences. One is the direct experience of your skin. I feel the waistband of my yoga pants. Then there is the second experience in actually your subtle intellect. Oh, these yoga pants are too tight. Do you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a second experience. Mm -hmm. Now, our metaphor falls down because the sensation of the waistband of your yoga pants is objective knowledge. Yourself is not objective knowledge. It's the constant experience of my own self. But in a, the problem occurs in the subtle intellect. The self is ever free. The self doesn't get realized. It's the subtle intellect that gets realized. Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. That technically is called pratyabhijnana recognition mm -hmm. it's the aha mm -hmm. so when i still the mind to the point where there's some space between my thoughts and then i take that attentive faculty the same attentive faculty that i said now feel the sensation of your waistband you can do it anywhere what do your toes feel like wiggle your toes you can feel it you know, we did not create your toes. We just became aware of the sensation of your toes. Mm. What we're doing now is becoming aware in the subtle intellect. What is selfing like? What is eyeing like? Language fails us here. Sanskrit is yourself is swayambhu, self-evident. Swayam Jyoti, self lighted, self luminous, self effulgent. But in the subtle intellect, in a mind made very quiet, with your attention turned toward that subject, inquire, well, what am I really like? Oh, I'm a terrible person. I have low self esteem and nobody likes me. Is that what you see in there? Well, I have low self-esteem. Now, wait a minute. That's a feeling. That's a thought. Nobody likes me. That's a thought. That's not me. I'm really a kind, generous opinion. Well, those are just thoughts. Who are you? And in that very quiet mind, you see, oh, there's nobody there. I thought I was a person with all these assets and liabilities, but in truth, those are qualities of what we call the upadis, the equipment. They are not qualities of the self. Self is kutusta. It is still immovable. Doesn't go anywhere. And in that subtle intellect, when it's turned within, in a quiet mind, it has the realization. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. this making sense now? Yeah. Yeah. It's thanks. like this. Has anybody seen my glasses? I've looked all over the house. I can't find my glasses. I looked in all the drawers. 
not on my dresser. Oh my God, I am, I haven't got my glasses. Oh, it's going to be such a burden to get around in the world because I don't have my glasses. What am I going to do? Oh, I always have them. I just didn't know it. <laughs> so also, you are always you. My problem is, I think I don't have it. And I certainly do not know that it is birthless and changeless and deathless and the source of all peace and joy. Because I'm stupid. Abhidya. Buddha. A fool. <laughs> That's the human condition. Mm. No Thank you. Yeah. Excellent question. Now, may I make a suggestion? Yes. Give up the idea in your mind of my soul. Okay. As if your soul is a little thing with wings inside or something like that. Or I have a transmigrating soul. I have a soul that's going here, a soul that's going there. What you want to stay with in this work is you. What we want to do is realize who am I? So it's not like reading a book about the transmigrating soul. That will free you, although we're going to talk about it. What you want to focus on is this pure awareness, this pure subjectivity. All right, so I have a lot of work to do. Yep. You're doing great. When you can ask a question like that, you're doing very well. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? This is very subtle stuff. All right. Got 15 more minutes. Next verse. By the way, before we go on, Swamiji used to say, I don't want any stupid questions. Oh, well. Say the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. He says, The guru is like a bell. You've got to bang it with your questions in order to get anything out of it. Questions are good. Next verse. Tatha Swapnetra Vedyam tu Nastiram Jagare Stiram Tadhe do Tastayo Samved Ekarupana Bhidyate. Similar is the case in the dream state. Here the perceived objects are transient and in the waking state they seem permanent. So there is difference between them. But the perceiving consciousness in both the states does not differ. It is homogenous. Yes. So later on, we're going to go into further analysis of the dream state. But for now, Vidyaranya is saying in the dream state, I have a dream body and a dream ego identified with it, and I have dream senses. I see, hear, taste, touch, and smell in the dream. Do you have smell in your dreams? Probably. Not too much. Not too much. But the point is, what illumines the objective phenomena in 
the dream state. The same awareness that illumines the phenomena of the waking state is also illuminating the subtle phenomena of the dream state. Now, the waking state and the dream state are different. I like to say you are the god of your dream. In the dream, your mind creates a world of name and form. And when you are the dreamer, you take that world as real. In a sense, this world is no different. The difference is who is doing the dreaming. So whatever Daniel dreamt last night, I do not know. What I dreamt last night, Asha does not know. But Ishwara is dreaming all this. But we're going to see that it comes about in a very similar way. But the point is who sees, who knows. Who am I? What is my essential nature? So as you're sitting in meditation initially, you might get these glimpses into the no-thingness of yourself. But then meditation in action as you're going through the day, remember to stop, check out, look, who am I? You have to see for yourself whether or not what Vidyaranya is saying is true. Are you always the same? Oh, I don't think he's right. I was meditating this morning and I think. No. Nirupam. I have no form. Don't believe me. Next verse. Sukto titasya saushukta tak no bodho bavet smritihi sachava buddha vishaya babuddham tattadatamaha. A person awaking from deep sleep consciously remembers their lack of perception during that state. Remembrance consists of objects experienced earlier. It is therefore clear that even in deep sleep, quote, want of knowledge, end quote, is perceived. Yes. So this is the proof that I is aware in deep sleep. Vidyaranya says we prove the existence of the self in deep sleep through the law of memory. Let's see if I can give you an example. Puneet, what did I have for breakfast this morning? I don't know. Why not? You didn't invite him for breakfast. <laughs> he wasn't there. You cannot remember something that you haven't experienced. 
yet when you awaken in the morning after a sound sleep, you can remember, oh, I must have slept so soundly. I don't remember a thing. So we can have the awareness of the absence of something as well as the presence of something. Let me give you an example. Can you see that the phone is in my hand? Yes? Yes. Can you see that the phone is not in my hand? Yes. Another example. With your eyes open, look around the room. I can see the objects in the room. Close your eyes now. Are you blind? No. You are seeing the back of your eyelids. You are seeing the obscuring of sight. But you are not blind. You are seeing darkness. Likewise, if I were to have blackout curtains in the room, all the lights were off, pitch black, would you be blind? No. You are seeing darkness. And if I light a candle, you see it immediately. Anybody wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom? I'm old. I always wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. If I were unconscious in deep sleep, how would I know that I woke up? Again, if you were blind and I lit a candle, so the point that Vidyaranya is getting at, the self illumines all three mind states. I am the knower of the phenomena of the waking state. I am the knower of the phenomena subtle in the dream state. I am the knower of the mind folded up into pure ignorance, the darkness of deep sleep. I am always there. I is constant. Now, this is where drugs can be problematic on the spiritual path. People can take a drug and they have some sort of a mind state and they think it's real. And they come down and they say, oh, Jim, I think I experienced great union with everything. I want to get back there. Notice it's always I, the ego, want to get to some place. Well, are you experiencing reality right now? No, I'm back to just being an ordinary, miserable person. Then you didn't get it. What is it that's there in the waking state? During all mind states, they're in the dream state. And here we can say all the drug states too. Oh, I took LSD and the toilet paper in the bathroom was breathing. Who saw it? I did. 
even illuminating deep sleep. When you realize yourself, you see that it's always here. Do not achieve it. You do not attain it. You do not become it. <coughs> you don't merge into it. All these are poetic expressions. We realize the eternal factor that is more literal than you can imagine. Nitya, always here. So if you realize the self, you realize what's pervading the waking state, pervading the dream state, pervading the deep sleep state, pervading every sense perception, pervading every mind state, even illuminating ignorance. Have you realized? No, Jim, I'm not realized I'm a worm. Are you in bondage? Oh, yes, I'm in bondage. By the way, do you exist? Yes, I exist. What's your existence? My existence, I'm in bondage and a worm. Notice the person thunders, I am. Do you know how miserable you are? Oh, you have no idea how I know how miserable I am. I know, I shine. It's never gone, ever. just my stupid mind that gets so confused. So what is the purpose of the guru? To remove avidya, this ignorance. Notice he doesn't say, oh, I'm going to take your miserable little self and boost it into Brahman, or you're going to be glued on to Brahman. No. I tell you, if it were attainable, you would lose it. But you are not attainable. You are realizing. But your Swabhava essential nature even now. So the assignment that Vidyaranya is giving us, who is it who's the knower of all perceptions, gross and subtle. Now don't worry about deep sleep and about his argument about deep sleep. Nobody ever got realized in deep sleep. So don't worry about it. If you, it's difficult to understand, just put it on the shelf. Right here in the waking state, See if you can begin to notice, make friends, become familiar with that eternal factor that is the knower of it. All right, let's do one more. Jim, I have a question. Please. So self-realization is a state of mind. Of that is correct. Mind. But still, a memory that is a function of a mind has to be there to witness the self. So if mind gets realized, but then Thurya or self-realization is defined as no mind. No, you have misunderstood Thurya. Mm. 
Turiya is the fourth. It is the fourth in our series of discussion. If you really look at Godapada's Karika in Mandukya, that's where the term comes from. First subject we're going to discuss, a uh, waking state. Second subject we're going to discuss, u, uh, dream state. Third subject we're going to discuss, m, deep sleep. Fourth subject we're going to discuss, the silence, the turiya, which is not a fourth plane of consciousness. It's not another mind state. It is the consciousness in which the three mind states move. That's always there. And Shankara is very clear in his discussion. He says it's not like the four legs of a cow. Remember that? Mm -hmm. It's just the fourth in our series of discussion. Turiya is not a mind state. Do not confuse Turiya with Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Does that make sense? Yes. So then self-realization, if it's considered as a no mind, then what remembers the experience of the self? Okay, you have to go there and find out. <laughs> but what the scriptures say, the best they can talk about is the mind disappears, but you're not unconscious. Then when the mind returns, it remembers this experience of its own disappearance. Oh, now rather than getting hung up, go to your direct experience. So if you tune up your mind right now, get very quiet. Just listen to the traffic. What hears the traffic? Do you get the sense that there's just that space of awareness? No. Who has or what has that understanding? Is it the self? So now, there are times when you're out there in the world and you're giving empathy uh, discussions or you're picking up your parents at the airport or uh, maybe having an argument with Gretchen. And Nilan seems very solid. Is that also making sense? All right. Okay. Now, you witness Nilan. You witness his disappearance and reappearance. How can you be Nila? Do you see that? So returning from Samadhi and essentially any time the mind is free from its vimarsha, its deliberation, we can call those fleeting samadhis. But it reveals by essential nature to what? To the mind. Mind and intellect, don't worry about that. That's simply description in terms of function. Don't get too caught up in that. But near be called the samadhi is a mind state. It's the mind state that reveals to the mind its own illusion, its own stupidity. It reveals to the mind that a personal sense of self is not real. Does that make it a little clear? Yes. Very good question. Many people get confused about that. And they think that when you hear the term Turiya, they think it's some <laughs> mind state. No, it's another name for you.
Here's the self. Here's the mind. Waking state. Dream state. Deep sleep state. Samadhi. Mind returns. Oh my gosh, there's nobody there. You shine constantly. You witness not only the pure darkness of deep sleep, but you witness the disappearance of the mind in samadhi. Very good questions. Any other ones? It's nine, so we need to stop, but I'll, if anybody's got anything else, it's a burning question. What verse are we on for next week? Six. Six, all right, we'll end here then. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachite Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Vyonaha Hari Om Thank you all and